Hello. This is a recording of a presentation given to the Directors of Special Education Institute, sponsored by the Kentucky Department of Education's Office of Special Education and Early Learning. The Institute was conducted on September 7th through the 9th of 2022. The title of this presentation is Latest Special Education Court Decisions. So the information contained in the presentation was accurate uh, as of the date of the presentation and as of the date of this recording. But if you have any concerns about the continuing validity of any of the cases or other materials presented, you should, as always, confer with your local board council. Also, please be aware that the information that will be shared as part of the presentation today does not constitute legal advice, but is instead information about recent court decisions, guidance issued by the United States Department of Education, and other sources that should be considered in the performance of day-to-day -day education functions and in compliance with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The first case that we're going to discuss answers the question, does the Craft Academy provide a secondary school education? This matter was brought before a due process hearing officer, then the Exceptional Children's Appeals Board, and then the Western District of Kentucky, a federal district court, and each answered the question, no. The case is presently on appeal before the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. The complaint in the case alleged a failure to implement a student's Individual Education Program, or IEP, due process violations in violation of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, Section 504, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and a Civil Rights Act, Section 1983, which is a federal statute. In considering the case, the court determined that FAPE means special education and related services that include secondary school education in the state. The IDEA uses this definition, but the court determined that this establishes a ceiling and that the IDEA does not include an education beyond grade 12. Post-secondary education can be IDEA eligible if it is considered secondary education under state law and an IEP team determined that it is necessary for the provision of FAPE or a free appropriate public education. The court in this case did not reach the second prong, however. Statutory definitions of dual credit and dual enrollment make clear that Craft Academy is a post-secondary school and the education it provides is considered a post-secondary education by Kentucky. For example, uh, it is housed in a, in a comprehensive university that is governed by a Board of Regents. The plaintiffs argued that the definition in the Keys Scholarship Statute uh, gave them the benefit of a definition there of residential high school. The court determined that that argument failed and was unsuccessful because that definition is limited to the scholarship statute and is actually intended to ensure that Craft Academy students qualify for a Keys award. The plaintiffs had also cited an opinion of Kentucky's Attorney General, but the court uh, accorded that no deference. Uh, finding that the opinion of the Attorney General ignored statutory language, and the court ultimately determined that as a matter of law, the obligation under the IDEA to make FAPE available to the student does not apply to the post-secondary education that he received at the Craft Academy. Speaking of appropriate secondary education, and as you consider the Bradley versus JCPS case, be aware of the intersection between this case and House Bill 194 from the 2022 session of the General Assembly, which expanded access to general equivalency diploma 
courses and programs in Kentucky, and letter to court issued by the Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP. As OSEP explained in that letter, if a GED prep program is part of an appropriate secondary education, and it does appear to be under Kentucky law and House Bill 194, the achievement of a GED credential does not satisfy the LEA's obligation to make FAPE available until the student obtains a regular diploma or exceeds the upper age limit of FAPE, age in the state, whichever occurs first. The next resource I want to discuss is Letter to Baruki. Uh, the question answered in this is, may a district discontinue special education and related services to a student who refuses to cooperate in attaining his IEP goals and objectives? Uh, this letter issued after a letter written to OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs, seeking clarification. The letter indicated a belief that the student had chosen to fail and suggested it, that it might be more prudent for the district to serve students who are willing to benefit from the program that they are offered in the school. In considering the matter, OSEP shared that each public agency must provide special education and related services to a handicapped child in accordance with an individualized education program. However, the IDEA does not require that any agency, teacher, or other person be held accountable if a child does not achieve the growth projected in the annual goals and objectives. The obligation of states and school districts to provide appropriate educational services to eligible students with handicaps is equally applicable to cooperative and uncooperative students. Here, the student's failure to cooperate with school staff may indicate the need for a reevaluation, a possible revision in the child's IEP, or even a change in the child's educational placement. OSEP explained that under these circumstances, it may be appropriate for school officials to convene an IEP meeting to review or revise the child's IEP. And if the participants at the IEP meeting decide to change or modify the child's IEP, the child's educational placement may have to be modified to conform to the IEP. So in response to the inquiry, OSEP shared that not only may the district may the district abate or end its efforts, um, they should in fact try harder to provide services. OSEP did go on to explain uh, that the discontinuance of services for a lack of cooperation by the student would violate the IDEA and could jeopardize the local education agency or district's federal funding. OSEP explained it by saying that if the SEA, in our case, the Kentucky Department of Education, determines that the LEA is unable or unwilling to provide FAPE to eligible children, the SEA may not distribute funds to that LEA. Okay, our next source is letter to IG. The question presented here is must an LEA evaluate a resident student who attends a private school in another LEA? And in fact, in this case, an LEA in a different state. Here, the student has always resided in Maryland. The student had never attended Maryland public schools and had always attended private school in the District of Columbia. The mother asked a school district in Maryland for an evaluation to determine the child's eligibility for special education, education services. The Maryland district refused and referred her to the DC district. In responding to the inquiry, OSEP explained that the parent may choose either district or even both districts, though OSEP does discourage parents from essentially asking for simultaneous evaluations in two districts that could be on the hook for providing those. OSEP explained that Maryland law here assigns responsibility to make FAPE available to the LEA in which the child's parent resides. Here, because the parent resides in Maryland, the Maryland district is responsible for ensuring the availability of FAPE for this particular child.
Okay, our next resource is Letter to Riley. And the question answered in Letter to Riley is, does the IDEA require an individual filing a state complaint to bear the burden of proof? Uh, this was based on an inquiry from a disability rights attorney. In answering, OSEP explained that the state complaint process is intended to be less adversarial than the more formal filing of a due process complaint and possible due process hearing. OSEP was aware of uh, the United States Supreme Court opinion in the case Schaefer v. Wiest, uh, but distinguished that as a due process hearing decision in which the party uh, seeking relief has been assigned by the U.S. Supreme Court the burden of proof. OSEP explained here that the legal authority for state complaints is the Secretary of Education's authority to implement programs and is actually a separate and broader authority than that governing due process complaints. They explained that neither party bears the burden of proof in a state complaint proceeding, which is actually more in the nature of independent fact-finding. They did go on, though, to say that it would not be inconsistent with the IDEA for a state to use a preponderance of the evidence standard in making an independent determination as to whether a public agency, a district in this case, violated a requirement of Part B of the IDEA. The next authority uh, for discussion is a Dear Colleague letter regarding virtual schools. The takeaway from this Dear Colleague letter is that child find, monitoring, data collection, personnel, a free and appropriate public education, or FAPE, the composition of an IEP team, or ARC in Kentucky, the review and revision of IEPs, and least restrictive environment requirements all apply equally in brick and mortar and in virtual schools. This Dear Colleague letter uh, was issued in response to questions from stakeholders that included state and school personnel and also advocacy organizations. The Dear Colleague letter is careful to state that it is non-binding, though significant guidance from the Office of Special Education Programs and also clarifies that in the view of the Department of Education, it does not create or impose new legal requirements. They referred and relied uh, in making these determinations and decisions on EdFax information data collection, which defines virtual courses as exclusively virtual in which children and teachers are separated by either location or by time. The LEA, uh, the district, is responsible for IDEA implementation in a virtual school that is operated by that district. The requirements of Part B that are still in force uh, and apply during virtual instruction in a virtual school are monitoring and correcting compliance, the timely collection and reporting of data, establishing and maintaining personnel qualifications, making dispute resolution procedures available, and ensuring confidentiality. The Dear Colleague letter also explains that each SEA or school district must have policies and procedures that ensure that children with disabilities who attend virtual school LEAs and virtual schools that are part of LEAs are included in all general and district-wide assessment programs. The Dear Colleague letter advises that districts should review the state's child find policies and procedures, as well as their own implementing policies, procedures, and practices to ensure the children with disabilities who attend virtual schools are identified, located, and evaluated. Reliance on referrals by parents should not be the primary vehicle for meeting child find requirements. Our next authority is Garza v. Lansing School District. 
The takeaway from this case is that school administrators must respond to ongoing reports that a teacher is mistreating students with disabilities and that failing to investigate or take appropriate disciplinary action could support a finding that administrators were deliberately indifferent to the legal rights of the child. The facts of this case, uh, it's a lawsuit brought on behalf of a 12-year-old boy with autism. The lawsuit filed uh, made a 14th Amendment claim. In hearing the case, a United States District Court ruled for the administrators. However, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed and remanded this for further proceedings. The facts of the case are very unfortunate. In October of 2014, a teacher, a classroom teacher, uh, threw and then kicked a student. Discovery in the case revealed that the teacher actually had an 11-year prior history of violence towards students. The facts are unfortunate, but deserve some consideration. The teacher taught in a school for, exclusively for students with disabilities. While teaching there uh, and under the supervision of one principal, the teacher had a documented history of slamming, squeezing, slapping, yelling at, and pushing students. The principal there retired having taken no disciplinary action or other corrective action regarding the teacher and upon retiring shredded all of her notes documenting uh, these incidents and sharing information that she had about this teacher with the incoming principal the outgoing principal explained that this was a very good teacher about whom she had received no complaints an incoming principal uh, then receives peer reports regarding the abuse of students. Matters are referred to human resources. There is evidence that the teacher continues to abuse and grab students. Notice is given of peer complaints, both to the DOES, the Director of Special Education in the district, and also to the superintendent. When confronted uh, with the allegations, the teacher denied the abuse. Human resources took no action. The peer who had originally lodged a complaint against the teacher complained about the shallowness of the investigation. An aide was removed from the classroom at her request after only four days after witnessing the teacher abuse a student. Yet another peer complaint was filed. And upon investigation, the teacher denied wrongdoing. The teacher explained to administration of the school that he was allowed to handle students in this way and that he was not going to stop. He was placed on paid leave pending further investigation. During that further investigation, it was determined that the teacher also had a habit of refusing students' requests to use the bathroom, with the result that students occasionally soiled themselves. It was revealed that the teacher had previously, during a recreational visit to a swimming pool, held a student underwater to get the student to stop complaining. Additionally, student injuries had been reported by parents, by guardianship services, and by a community mental health provider. The teacher was then referred to anger management and was initially suspended for three days without pay that was later reduced to a one-day suspension without pay, and even that was eventually uh, reduced to a written reprimand. The second principal, as the first did, shredded all of her notes regarding this teacher upon her retirement. The director of special education then transferred the teacher to another school uh, for students with disabilities. While at the second school, the teacher was again accused of physical abuse However, uh, the director of special education explained that there was no documentation, no witnesses, no statements, and nothing in the human resources file regarding this teacher, who he described as a good teacher. Once at the second school, this teacher threw a student, which was investigated by human resources. However, he was cleared to return to work. 
the principal uh, indicated that she believed that it was OK to return the teacher to a classroom because human resources had not made a finding of wrongdoing on his part. Students continued to be removed from the teacher's classroom at parent request. The principal at the second at the second school documented uh, that the teacher had a perfect score in classroom management and recommended that the teacher's employment be continued. Ultimately, then in October of 2014, the teacher abused the plaintiff student, the 12 year old boy with autism and was placed on administrative leave. He was then charged criminally by the local police with fourth degree child abuse and then resigned pursuant to agreement, having never been formally fired by the school district. The conclusion of the court in reviewing that, and the court being here being the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, was that where a district has knowledge that its remedial action is inadequate and ineffective, it is required to take reasonable action in light of those circumstances to eliminate the behavior. Supervisors may not turn a blind eye to teacher misconduct. Negligent or sloppy supervision does not rise to this level. Uh, however, in this case, a reasonable official in the position of any of these defendants and the people sued were the school principals, the director of special education and the superintendent. Any of those would have known that their response to the teacher's abuse of students was insufficient and unlawful. For those reasons, they are not entitled to qualified immunity and the case was reversed and remanded back to the district court for further proceedings to determine the extent of liability. The next case that I'm going to talk about is HC versus the Fleming County Board of Education. This case stands for the proposition that legitimate, non-discriminatory, and well-documented reasons for, ad for actions adverse to a parent and a student are both permissible and lawful in some circumstances. Here, the district court dismissed a Section 504 claim filed by the parent, after which the attorney for the parent, the plaintiff, uh, withdrew from the case. The case was then appealed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which affirmed the decision of the district court. The lawsuit filed here alleged a failure to provide a free appropriate public education, violations of Section 504, violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act, violations of Section 1983, a civil rights statute, procedural due process violations, retaliation, negligence, negligent training, negligent hiring, negligent supervision, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Here, the defendants carry their burden to show legitimate and non-discriminatory reasons for their actions. The record in the case reveals that the child had struck another child with an oversized pencil and threatened to shoot a different child. The mother had been banned from school property due to her behavior and criminal trespass complaints were filed after the mother disregarded a letter from the district banning her from school property without permission. Truancy charges against the mother stemmed not from any inappropriate action on behalf of the district, but from the 22 unexcused absences of a sibling child, a child who is a sibling of the plaintiff child, that had accrued while the plaintiff child stayed at home. The court found that these defendants were entitled to qualified immunity because their acts were discretionary, they acted in good faith, and they acted within the scope of their employment. So it's important to contrast the actions of the district here and the responsiveness of administrators here with those of the administrators in the Garza case mentioned just a few moments ago. The very good and contemporaneous record keeping of the Fleming County District in this case um, did them great favors in the resolution of the matter and likely led 
to the resolution of the case in their favor, both by the trial court and then by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. The next case is Clemens versus the Shelby County Board of Education, or BOE, as, uh, as abbreviated on your slide. This case stands for the proposition that a predetermination by a coach whether a student with a disability would make the tennis team could result in a discrimination complaint if the exclusion was based on disability related behaviors. The lawsuit in this case alleged violations of Title IX, Section 504, made an equal protection claim under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution and Kentucky Constitution. The district court hearing the case granted summary judgment uh, on all claims. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, however, reversed and remanded, though only on the Section 504 claim, which means that that claim of all the ones cited actually returned to the district court for further disposition and hearing. The facts are that the student uh, who suffered with severe Asperger's disorder and anxiety had played between two and three prior years on the school's tennis team. The school then hired a new coach and problems immediately arose between the student and the coach. Uh, the student suffered panic attacks and also acted out in significant ways, both toward the co coach and toward peers. Uh, the student did not qualify to participate in regional tournament, uh, in a regional tournament for the tennis team, uh, and frustrated, then both quit the team and withdrew from school, though the record indicates that she did attend the tennis banquet to some consternation uh, in the district. The student did end that season, despite uh, her troubles there, uh, with three wins, three recorded wins. Over the summer, the parent sends a letter to the superintendent of the district alleging that the child had been discriminated against in violation of Section 504. The superintendent then responded to the parent's inquiry, indicating that the district is not aware that the child has a 504 plan, but inviting uh, and asking the student and, and the mother to re-enroll the student both in the district and to have the student resume playing tennis. The student is then re-enrolled by the mother. There is conversation about Section 504 accommodations, but a Section 504 plan is not actually made until January following the child's enrollment. That 504 plan, however, does not mention tennis. Tryouts are held for the tennis team, and testimony in the record of the case indicates that the coach had already decided that the student would not make the team. The decision that the child would not make the team was overruled after the parent made a complaint. Section 504 accommodations were then discussed. Ultimately, however, the student quit after four days on the tennis team and withdrew from school. The court determined that it could be concluded that with reasonable com accommodations, the student would have met the team's requirements. Peers, other than the sisters of the student, were not excluded from or cut from the team. So the court determined that there was evidence in the record that this student was treated differently from non-disabled peers. Each reason that was cited by the coach before tryouts related to behavior that was directly attributed to the student's Asperger's and anxiety and her behavior uh, essentially was an indication of that disability uh, rather than something that ran alongside it. Our next case is Independent School District number 283 versus EMDH. And those are the initials of the student. You may notice that as a theme here uh, in federal cases and in other cases, often students and their families are identified only by initials rather than by name to a protect the anonymity of the student and to avoid any stigma that might be attached uh, by virtue of exercising either legal rights or seeking recognition for asserted rights. 
The determination in the case here is that a student whose anxiety and depression prevent her from accessing the general education curriculum may be eligible for IDEA services despite above average academic performance. Here, the parents filed a due process complaint. The administrative law judge found the child eligible, ordered the district to develop an IEP, ordered quarterly IEP team meetings, ordered $25,000 in reimbursement for the diagnostic and educational expenses that the parents had incurred, made an order of compensatory education, ordered that the plaintiff, the student's experts, be permitted at district expense to attend the child's ARCs. The matter was then appealed to the district court, which affirmed, agreed with each of those findings, but for expenses related to future tutoring. There was a cross appeal. Each party appealed that decision, and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the decision and reinstated the expenses that had been stripped out by the district court. The history here is important. The student had entered psychiatric treatment uh, by the second grade. She had some period of success attending elementary school, but in the eighth grade year, by the eighth grade year, was suffering repeated psychiatric hospitalizations and had very poor attendance. Her grades were marked as incompletes and she was disenrolled from school. In the ninth grade, the student was again psychiatrically hospitalized and had very poor attendance. The student was again disenrolled. A special education referral was considered. However, the student's parents were advised that if the student was identified as a student with a disability, she would no longer be able to participate in honors classes. After some additional absences, the district disenrolled the child. The child was again psychiatrically hospitalized in the 10th grade. Some accommodations were discussed and implemented for the student, but the student attended school virtually not at all. The student was then disenrolled. Inquiry was made about a special education referral. Again, the parents were advised that if the student were identified as a student with a disability, that she would no longer have access to honors classes. The child was then disenrolled. The parents then requested a special education evaluation despite assurances that this would impact the student's access to honors classes. The student began the 11th grade with a pattern of significantly poor attendance, and the record indicates that by the 11th grade, the student had met less than half of the graduation requirements um, of the district and state. All but two of the student's academic credits had been accrued during periods of psychiatric treatment and hospitalization. Seven months after the request for evaluation, the district shared their evaluation, which determined that the child was not eligible for special education. The parents then, at their own expense, obtained an independent education evaluation, or IEE. The district rejected that independent educational evaluation, and the parent then filed the due process complaint that kicked off the series of litigation. The determination was that the district's evaluation was insufficient. The district conducted no systematic observations, did not assess the student in the classroom, did not assess the student at home, did not assess the student in psychiatric facilities. The district had made a determination that the student's symptoms were insufficient to constitute serious emotional disturbance or other health impairment, OHI. However, the court determined that the student was absent not because of bad choices, as the district had termed it, but instead because of compromised mental health, for which the IDEA does provide a remedy. The district maintained that the student was simply too gifted to qualify for special education, citing her standardized test scores and exceptional performance on the rare occasions that she did attend school. The court pointed out, though, that the IDEA ensures a free and appropriate public education no matter the student's innate intelligence. 
The court explained that districts must educate a wide spectrum of disabled children, including those whose handicap is not cognitive. The district knew by the student's eighth grade year that this student was eligible for special education services, yet did not refer her. The district asserted that the statute of limitations had run and that the student and parents were powerless legally uh, to address the concerns that they had. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, though, ruled that this was instead a repeated violation by the district that extended well into the limitations period. The court explained that the cost incurred by the parents were necessitated only by the district's failure to timely identify and properly evaluate the student, and that imposing liability for compensatory education, though expensive, merely requires the defendants to belatedly, belatedly pay expenses that they should have paid all along. And to the point that the student's intellectual ability was not compromised yet was relied upon in the district in denying special education is a common misperception. Uh, for example, in Kentucky's December 1st, 2021 child count, less than 13% of students with disabilities actually had intellectual disabilities. So I think that's important to consider in light of this case. The next case here is MP versus Parkland School District. Now, this is not Parkland in Florida. This is a, a different school district. The takeaway from this case is that when a parent requests an independent education evaluation or IEE, the district's only options are to fund the IEE or to file a due process complaint. The LEA, the district, may not independently decline to fund the IE, and doing so deprives the district of a hearing to prove the appropriateness of its own evaluation. In this case, the grandmother filed a due process complaint. As part of that complaint, she asserted that FAPE had not been provided, that the student had been discriminated against in violation of the IDEA and the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that the district had failed to respond to her request for an independent education evaluation. The independent hearing officer assigned by the state found that this was a harmless error. There were cross appeals and the Eastern District for the federal court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania finds error regarding the independent, evalu independent education evaluation and awards attorney's fees. This is a multiply and severely disabled student. Uh, the record indicates that the district had produced and, and implemented wholly and entirely appropriate IEPs, uh, despite frequent absences of the student necessitated by her medical fragility and by a great many demands made by the student's family. The grandmother appropriately and properly procedurally demanded an IE. And the record is not clear that this would have accomplished anything based on the, the strength of the district's work with the student. However, the IEE request had been appropriately made. Upon receipt of the IEE request, the district must, without unnecessary delay, either file due process to show that its evaluation was appropriate or fund the IEE. What the district may not do is unreasonably delay acting upon the IEE request. Here, the district upon receipt of the IEE request wrote to the grandmother explaining that she had unilaterally withdrawn the student and asking whether she intended to withdraw the request for an IEE. In other words, they did not do either of the two things they were, were required to do. Instead, they tried to shift the burden to the grandmother. The district was permitted to ask why she wanted the independent educational evaluation, but could not require her to provide an explanation. The student's absences were not relevant, said the court. The IDEA does not say that the grandmother cannot have an IEE after a certain number of absences, and this was not a harmless error. 
since the grandmother won on this issue, even after losing on all of the other issues in the case, she is the prevailing party in the litigation and is entitled to attorney's fees. Attorney's fees uh, can be awarded if the plaintiff succeeds on any significant issue in litigation, which achieves some of the benefit the party sought in bringing the suit. Next case for discussion is TH versus DeKalb County School District, uh, DeKalb County in Georgia. The holding in the case, the takeaway, is that law enforcement officials responsible for managing detention facilities can be liable for violating the IDEA if their actions interfere with the provision of a free and appropriate education. Though a district, an LEA, needs information about and access to students to provide a FAPE, it still shares responsibility for child find and implementation failures. This is a case of first impression, uh, meaning that it had not previously been litigated in this federal circuit. Two uh, classes were certified, class action uh, lawsuit was filed, and two separate classes were certified. The plaintiffs that we're discussing here were students with disabilities who alleged that they did not receive services while they were incarcerated. Suit was filed against the local school district, against the superintendent, against the Georgia Department of Education, against the state superintendent of the Georgia Department of Education, and against the DeKalb County Sheriff. It was agreed by the parties through discovery uh, that the facts revealed that the plaintiffs did in fact spend less time with district staff than was required by their IEPs. Federal regulations implementing the IDEA apply to state and local education agencies, as well as to state and local juvenile and adult correctional facilities. The court explained that the statute itself then contemplates the provision of FAPE to incarcerated children with a disability. When there is a collective responsibility for the political subdivisions in a state for implementing the IDEA, State law defines the scope of each actor's responsibilities. The sheriff here argued that the Georgia law did not define her responsibility and argued that since she was making documented efforts to comply, despite the inherent logistical challenges involved in running a, a correctional facility along with COVID restrictions, she should be absolved of wrongdoing. The Federal District Court for the Northern District of Georgia found that instead, the lack of specific obligations in state law makes each political subdivision liable to the plaintiffs. Because the sheriff is solely responsible for managing the district's access to students, any IDEA violations stemming from that lack of access renders both the school district and the sheriff liable. The court explained that without a formal child fine system in the jail, the district's ability to carry out its child fine duty is inhibited. The court, though, explains that to the extent that the district's access is inadequate, the sheriff is liable for these child fine obligations. So some inconsistency, but the takeaway is that neither the correctional facility nor the district are absolved of responsibility. They are collaterally responsible for the implementation of the IDEA. Substantial fees were awarded in this case. The district paid $75,000 in fees. The Georgia Department of Education paid $400,000 in fees. And the court ordered that the sheriff of DeKalb County pay fees of $530,000. The last case for consideration is Cooper versus School, City of Hammond. The lesson of this case is that parents cannot sue a local education agency or district under the IDEA for failing to provide a properly licensed teacher. However, not providing a licensed teacher may cause educational harm and may lead to an appropriate state complaint. 
Here, the parent filed a due process complaint regarding her child's eligibility determination. After an extended hearing, the independent hearing officer determined that the student was deprived of a licensed teacher for months. The licensed teacher went on medical leave for several months, and the substitute teacher was not a licensed special education teacher. The independent hearing officer also found that the parent did not timely receive a copy of the student's IEP and that the LEA, the district, failed to timely and correctly evaluate the student's needs. The prescribed remedy, though, was merely another meeting with the IEP team. Unhappy with that result, the mother filed suit against the psychologist who evaluated the student and also against the school. The U.S. District Court uh, in the Northern District of Indiana dismissed with prejudice, meaning it cannot be filed again, the parents complained about the lack of a licensed teacher. The court explained that the IDEA is extremely clear that there is no right of action in federal court regarding the licensure issue. The only remedy for the parent in these circumstances is to file a complaint with a state education agency. This slide contains contact information uh, should you wish to submit a question or have feedback on the presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a good day.